with internet, uh, please let me know. Um, over the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to be talking about the work that I've done on uh, iron on a type of uh, magnetite rich deposit or a class of magnetite rich deposits called iron oxide appetite or IOA systems. Um, and uh, this work was a part of my PhD uh, and uh, is ongoing to this present uh, day right now. So for starters, I just want to take us here to uh, what has become the focal point for current um, debate and discussion about the formation and genesis of IOA systems. This is the Alaco Volcanic Complex. It's located in uh, northern Chile in the central volcanic zone along the border between Chile and Argentina. And uh, like a lot of the other volcanoes that dot this area uh, in the central volcanic zone, uh, the Alaco complex is mostly composed of massive to porphyritic flows that are about uh, roughly andesite in composition. However, in the Alaco complex itself, there's something uh, very unusual. And that is that uh, interbedded with the andesite flows are a number of volcanic features that have compositions that are about 90% iron oxide. So that's mostly magnetite with lesser amounts of hematite. And um, these features include uh, very conspicuous uh, you know, volcanic, volcanic features like uh, uh, columnar jointed flow-like flow structures that emanate out from the central volcanic edifice and terminate at uh, vesiculated dike-like features that extend beneath the volcanic complex itself. Um, large flows, or rather uh, large laminated, uh, what look like asphalt deposits that have um, pieces of ejecta and what look like volcanic bombs uh, included in them that are all made out of magnetite. And um, more smaller scale features like skeletal magnetite and um, large bubble or gas escape tubes that are lined with euhedral magnetite crystals. And I've just shown all of those features on this slide right here. I like to start here because this kind of gets at the major um, question about IOA deposits or the major point of uh, controversy. And that is, how is it that you can form these uh, very unambiguous looking volcanic and magmatic features that have compositions that are almost entirely iron oxide? You know, if there's any uh, igneous petrologist in the audience right now, you'll know immediately that this, uh, you know, that composition is rather unusual for igneous rocks, especially compared to what we normally think of as being an igneous rock. So, from this controversy uh, has uh, spawned a number or uh, uh, a diversity of uh, genetic models for IOA systems that span a spectrum between uh, magmatic and hydrothermal end members. Um, on the magmatic side of thing, or the purely orthomagmatic models for IOA system uh, involve the formation of an IOA ore body via the, via the emplacement and crystallization of an iron phosphate magma that's formed via emissibility with a parental silicate melt. And I've just shown a diagram here on the left-hand side of the uh, slide that just kind of shows how that happens. You start out with a fluorine enriched silicate melt that undergoes uh, melt emissibility to form a separate iron or iron phosphate liquid. And that iron and phosphate liquid uh, accumulates in the magma chamber to form a discrete uh, melt or a crystal mush. And that melt or mush is emplaced in the IOA system where it forms massive magnetite ore bodies and large flow like structures. Now, this magmatic model is uh, very compelling because, well, for first and foremost, because it uh, explains well or accounts well for the presence of these magmatic and volcanic features in IOA systems. It's also rather compelling because there's some good natural evidence that it occurs. Here, I've just shown uh, on the left-hand side are some pictures of uh, iron and silica, iron-rich blebs that are alongside silica-rich blebs or globules that are entrained in residual volcanic glass from a number of mafic systems. In a seminal paper by Philpotts 1982, he showed that these, the composition of these globules um, define the ends of an emissibility gap that exists in this system and that these globules itself uh, likely arise from the emissibility of a parental tholiatic magma. And indeed, there are a number of experimental studies that show how you could form an iron phosphate melt. Um, However, these uh, experimental studies are uh, somewhat challenging uh, for a number of reasons. 
among which are the facts that a lot of these models involve starting materials or run products that uh, don't uh, precisely uh, replicate the geochemistry that we see in IOA systems, both in terms of host rocks and the IOA ores themselves. Um, and in several of these models, the temperatures needed to stabilize an iron rich melt is in excess of what thermometry would generally infer for the formation of a lot of IOA systems. There's also a, a more broad problem with how you would emplace an iron rich melt, given the fact that an iron rich melt would have a great density contrast with its, which it's, with its parental silicate melt and would likely um, sink rather than float. So all of these are challenges to the magmatic model. Um, the recognition of hydrothermal features in a lot of IOA systems, and in particular, the uh, extensive aureoles of sodium and calcium rich alteration that typically envelop a lot of uh, IOA deposits has led to the development of a number of hydrothermal models that involve the uh, transport and precipitation of uh, iron rich hydrothermal fluids that are from a variety of sources, uh, including things like magmatic, basinal and metamorphic fluids. And I've just shown a couple of uh, examples of those models here on the left hand side of this slide. On the far left hand side is a situation that's you know akin to what you might think of uh, in a porphyry system. This is like the magmatic hydrothermal IOA model in which you have um, iron rich hydrothermal fluids that are exhaled from a crystallizing melt and are circulated upwards into an ore body uh, via magmatic heat. And then in the center, you have uh, more of a amagmatic an amagmatic hydrothermal model for IOA systems in which um, basinal or surface derived fluids uh, acquire iron via leaching of country rocks and are circulated upwards into an ore zone either via magmatic or tectonic heat. So two different hydrothermal models. One of them is kind of uh, magmatic hydrothermal similar to a porphyry deposit. And another one is an amagmatic model similar to what you might think of as like salt and sea type mineralization. In recent years, a number of hybrid orthomagmatic and hydrothermal models have also been developed. And I've just shown here on the right-hand side of the slide an example of um, a key uh, hybrid model from uh, Adam Simon's group at the University of Michigan. And in this model, the initial source of the iron oxide itself is orthomagmatic and that orthomagmatic magnetite or iron oxide is subsequently entrained in dissolving hydrothermal fluids and is emplaced by a um, buoyancy driven like flotation mechanism. Now, despite uh, extensive study over the last couple of decades and uh, this diversity of models, there is little consensus about the actual, you know, key genetic mechanisms involved in IOA formations. And in particular, there's little consensus about the nature of mineralizing fluids in these systems. And uh, that is kind of the starting off point for my work with IOA deposits as um, a lot of my work has focused on looking at the actual composition and evolution of uh, ore forming fluids in these systems by looking at inclusions that are hosted in ore stage mineralogy from IOA systems. And we're gonna see three key examples of that in the following slides. So the first system I looked at uh, is called Buena Vista. It's located in um, West Central Nevada. And um, the Buena Vista system is associated with the Humboldt Mafic complex. And this complex actually hosts a number of IOA deposits and I've just shown them here on this map. Um, Buena Vista itself is shown in red and then there's a couple of other IOA deposits here in yellow. And the uh, IOA mineralization here is pretty characteristic, pretty consistent with what we see in IOA deposits globally. And it uh, ranges in character from uh, massive replacement bodies uh, to uh, magnetite cemented breaches, and as well as um, what is really a classic feature of IOA systems, a magnetite apatite dikes or magnetite apatite dikes that have um, really well developed UST or uh, syntaxial growth textures that are defined by minerals like apatite and diopside. And I've just shown some pictures of that here. Um, this system was uh, the starting point for my project because it's the type locality for the amagmatic hydrothermal model for IOA systems. So that is a model involving the formation of IOA mineralization via the circulation of amagmatic basinally derived fluids that acquire um, iron via leaching of igneous host rocks and are circulated via magmatic heat. And uh, this interpretation is based uh, primarily on mass balance constraints between the volcanic host rocks for this system and the IOA ores themselves. 
as well as on the observation of abundant brine rich inclusions in ore stage mineralogy uh, from the Buena Vista system. And on the fact that the system, the Humboldt, uh, the Humboldt complex itself hosts uh, more than 900 cubic kilometers of scapolite dominated sodic calcic alteration. And the system, that sodic calcic alteration is really extensive around the, the ore deposits themselves. And I've just shown a picture here on the left-hand side. Uh, you know, would you believe that this rock was once gabbro diorite? I mean, this rock has been, the, the original mafic mineralogy of this rock has been almost completely complaced by, completely replaced. Um, by scapolite and by, you know, sodic calcic rich alteration. So, you know, this thing has been completely juiced and clearly, you know, there's evidence of circulation of some kind of fluid in the system. One thing I want to point out is that Buena Vista itself, the ore body consists mostly of a large uh, breccia hosted ore body that's cross cut by magnetite apatite veins. And um, it also hosts a large or, or several large uh, dike or bleb like uh, carbonate features that have carbonate and then uh, minor magnetite and apatite. And these are all part of the ore sage mineralogy in this system. And uh, for my uh, work, I took a look at apatite and actinolite crystals that were hosted in these uh, breccias, as well as um, the apatite crystals that are hosted inside of this kind of carbonate dike like feature. So what did we find? Well, for starters, throughout the paragenesis of the Buena Vista system, there are abundant uh, brine rich inclusions. And those inclusions, I've just shown two pictures here. Uh, generally, they normally have a vapor and a liquid and some kind of a salt crystal. This is initially interpreted to be halite, but uh, commonly can have more uh, crystalline translucent phases. And I've just shown a picture of that here where you have you know, some uh, vapor liquid and then some of these crystalline phases. Now, during microthermometry, it was noted that these inclusions have very unusual microthermometric behavior. And uh, in particular, they show final melting temperatures above zero, so between seven to 11 degrees C. And I'm just gonna show a video uh, here of that happening. Um, in this video, I'm cooling one of these aqueous inclusions down to negative 150 C. And then I'm gonna progressively heat it up. As we heat it, uh, we see uh, evidence of first melting at about negative 80 degrees C. And then as we approach um, zero, we're going to see it melt at about seven degrees C. So right there, I'll roll that back once just in case anyone missed it. Uh, we're at about negative seven degrees C and we're approaching zero and you're gonna watch it melt right at about seven. And you can see that these inclusions that are out of focus that are in the background also show that very same abrupt melting at about you know, between seven to 11 degrees C. So this is very unusual microthermometric behavior that isn't consistent with what we generally observe in the aqueous chloride fluids that we would typically associate with a lot of base metal uh, mineralization. Rather, we interpret this behavior to represent the decomposition of a salt hydrate that has significant concentrations of carbonate and sulfate um, in the aqueous solution. So in order to test that interpretation, uh, we took a look at crystalline residues that were present in inclusions that have been exposed at the surface of samples uh, via polishing and uh, at uh, decrepitate solute mounds that are formed via the thermal decrepitation of fluid inclusions uh, that are inside of samples and the venting of that liquid material onto the surface of the sample where we can then analyze it using EDS and Raman. And here I've just shown some of these EDS maps that we uh, produced and sure enough, uh, there are significant concentrations of both carbon and sulfur in the crystalline residues from these aqueous inclusions and uh, Raman analysis of the uh, actual decrepitate mounds themselves are consistent with the presence of both carbonate uh, and minor sulfate uh, in these aqueous solutions. So here's, I would say, probably the most important slide in the whole entire show. So associated with all of these um, brine rich inclusions that we observed, there are um, coeval assemblages of polycrystalline inclusions. And I've just shown two pictures of that here in panel A and panel C. 
Um, these polycrystalline inclusions occur throughout the perigenesis of the Buena Vista system, both uh, you know, everywhere we looked, and we observed them uh, in actinolite, apatite, and in the magnetite ore itself. And they have compositions that are rich in carbonate with minor quartz, and they contain iron oxide in the form of hematite, and you can see that here as this opaque crystal that's down here in the bottom. Um, and I've just shown some uh, Raman spectra of one of these uh, inclusions that's exposed at the surface of the sample and uh, corresponding EDS maps of that uh, inclusion. Also, we performed uh, high temperature uh, microthermometric experiments on these inclusions, and I'm just gonna show a video of that here. Um, these inclusions, you can see this has a really nice uh, hematite crystal that's up here near the top. And as we heat it up, uh, you're gonna be able to see these kind of darker features in the inclusion deform uh, near 700 degrees C. And uh, right after that happens, you see a, a front of melting essentially sweep across the inclusion. So um, all of this taken together indicate that these polycrystalline inclusions represent aliquots of trapped carbonate melt that's associated associated with the formation of IOA mineralization in the system. So I'll say that again, there are carbonate melts that are associated, iron rich carbonate melts that are associated with the ore stage mineralogy of this system. What's more is that in our uh, survey of inclusions throughout the perigenesis of the system, these are the most uh, iron rich fluids that we observed. In fact, they have a discrete iron rich phase that's inside of them. And that indicates that this fluid is, you know, at least from the data that we've collected here, seems to be the primary um, uh, medium for iron transport and precipitation in this system. So that's a rather unusual observation and it begs the question, is this something that uh, you know, applies to IOA systems more broadly or is this just something that's going on at Buena Vista? So to answer that question, we took a look at another uh, fairly characteristic IOA system that's located in uh, Southwestern Utah. This is the Iron Spring system and um, these IOA deposits are associated with uh, Monzonite intrusions that are intruding into evaporite bearing carbonate rock. And uh, in these maps, you can see the intrusions themselves are these kind of topographic highs that have a lot of the vegetation on them. And these flat areas out here is the carbonate or, or the, the evaporite bearing carbonate sedimentary rock. And you can see along the periphery of these intrusions is where all these open pits are. And that's where the IOA mineralization is. And um, for the most part, the IOA mineralization takes the form of these uh, magnetite apatite dikes um, that have very well-developed columnar jointing and um, USTs that are defined by apatite crystals and vesiculated center lines. So all features that are you know, very uh, standard in IOA systems and akin to what we would see uh, in Elaco itself. Um, However, the system also includes um, a number of replacement ore bodies, and I've just shown that in a schematic cartoon here. Here's the monzonite intrusion. Uh, here's some evaporite bearing carbonate sediments, and here are the magnetite apatite dikes, and you have these replacement ore bodies that are in both the monzonite and the evaporite bearing carbonate sedimentary rock along its contact. And I just put a big uh, question mark down here because it's I, I observed the magnetite apatite dikes cutting both the limestone and the monzonite intrusion, but it's not sure whether or not they're emanating outwards from this contact or if they're emanating out from the center of the intrusion itself. And I think that that's uh, you know, important to state that that's kind of uh, unclear based on um, our field observations. So what did we find when we looked uh, at the ore stage mineralogy and the inclusions that they host? Well, first off, um, in Iron Springs, there are abundant, just like in Buena Vista, there are abundant assemblages of um, brine rich inclusions that have liquid vapor, halite, and commonly have additional unidentified crystalline translucent solids. And during micro uh, thermometry, we noticed that these inclusions display the same unusual microthermometric behavior, like identical microthermometric behavior to what we saw in brine inclusions in Buena Vista. So that is final melting temperatures between seven to 14 degrees C um, and uh, you know melting behavior that's consistent with the presence of significant sulfate and carbonate in the aqueous solution. I'm just gonna show one of our microthermometric experiments here. You can see that there used to be a salt crystal in this inclusion. As we heated it up, that salt crystal reacted with the ice. And um, as we are 
past zero, we're going to approach about 10 degrees C, and you're going to see it rapidly decompose and the formation of and the reappearance of that salt crystal. And again, what we're seeing here, I'll just roll that back so you can see it one more time. What we're seeing here is the formation of a salt hydrate that has carbonate and sulfate and the rapid decomposition of that salt hydrate at a very tight temperature envelope of about 10 degrees. So that's uh, you know very unusual microthermometric behavior that we've observed in aqueous inclusions from both of these systems. So also just like in Buena Vista, um, Iron Springs, the in Iron Springs, uh, the aqueous inclusions are associated with coeval assemblages of polycrystalline inclusions, and these polycrystalline inclusions are very similar to what we see in Buena Vista, uh, except for the fact that they have. Uh, far more sulfate, uh, or rather their compositions are much more sulfate rich and contain um, carbonate as a accessory phase in the form of natrite and trona and have uh, silicate in the form of elastinite, which makes sense if you have, you know, quartz and carbonate together, you know, they should react to form elastinite. And just like in Buena Vista, these uh, inclusions uh, show microthermometric behavior that's consistent with their formation at magnetic conditions. And this one is going to melt somewhere around, I'd say uh, 700, 750 degrees C. And here you'll see the abrupt melting of the inclusion right now. And then the subsequent shrinking of the uh, iron oxide, the hematite that's in that inclusion. And the incomplete uh, homogenization of this inclusion is related to the diffusion of hydrogen out of that inclusion. It's a fairly common thing. Uh, that happens in, in melt inclusions. So your know, take home message here is that both in Buena Vista and in Iron Springs, we see these carbonate sulfate, we see abundant assemblages of carbonate sulfate melt inclusions that are associated with brine inclusions and appear to be the most iron rich fluid observed in the ore stage mineralogy. Um, and you know, from that, we've interpreted that these melts, that these carbonate sulfate melts are likely the main fluid involved in the transport and precipitation of iron in these systems. So from this, this kind of um, you know, begs the question, where, where do these melts come from? Where do these carbonate sulfate melts come from? Well, in both Buena Vista and Iron Springs, there's no indication of uh, carbonatite magmatism either at the surface or at depth, nor is there any evidence of highly evolved alkali magmatism. Um, and both of you know carbonatites, alkali magmatism, um, you know, are the normal usual suspects when we talk about carbonate melts, but there's no indication of either one in these systems. Rather, we look to the common cross-cutting relationship between uh, mafic and intermediate igneous rocks and evaporate and carbonate bearing sedimentary rocks in both of these systems and indeed in IOA systems more broadly and interpret that these carbonate sulfate melts likely arise from the anatexis or assimilation of evaporate and carbonate of evaporate and carbonate uh, or rather of evaporate bearing carbonate sedimentary rocks by the intrusions that are associated with these deposits. This interpretation is fairly consistent with uh, experimental work that's looked at phase relations in carbonate systems. And um, you know, recent experiments have showed that carbonate systems can have eutectic, carbonate bearing uh, systems can have eutectic temperatures that go as low as 600 degrees C and can be even lower in the presence of excess H2O, um, aqueous chloride salts or um, other fluxing agents like fluorine and boron. And I've just shown the results of one of those experiments here in a magnesium, uh, calcium, and silica bearing system with water and H2O. And you can see that the eutectic temperature of this system is pretty low, like almost 600 degrees C. And in light of the fact that a lot of this temperature is uh, much lower than the wet solidus temperature of a lot of igneous systems, you know, it makes perfect sense that, you know, if you had the intrusion of an igneous rock, you know, say like a, a mafic rock, something that was, you know, a morbid composition, that you could get significant melting of uh, carbonate and evaporate bearing sedimentary rocks. And this is particularly true in the presence of excess water because that would keep the uh, XCO2 inside of the system fairly low by washing the CO2 out um, as you devolatilize and uh, initiate melting in these systems. So to evaluate that interpretation, uh, we took a look specifically at the contact between gabbro diorite and the evaporite bearing uh, carbonate rock 
in the Buena Vista system. And I've just shown some pictures of what that contact look like, looks like. And um, along that contact, there's a lot of textures that are fairly consistent with, you know, melting or partial melting of that sedimentary rock. In particular, in particular, in particular there's abundant, um, what look like breaches or flow, like uh, abundant breaches that have flow-like features. Um, where you have class of the gabbro diorite with kind of this uh, coarsely crystalline euhedral carbonate material that's around it. And as you go further into the gabbro diorite, um, you know, walking away from the contact, there are abundant uh, veins or carbonate veins that can be one to about 10 centimeters in thickness. And these veins uh, have envelopes of iron oxide along their periphery and they cut all the way into the gabbro diorite intrusion. Also, if you walk from the center of the intrusion or, or you know, distal from that carbonate contact towards the contact, I noted that the magnetic, the magnetic susceptibility of the gyrodiorite intrusion increases with proximity to that contact. So all of these things uh, taken together, you know, seem like they indicate that there was melting along that contact and that that melt was involved in partitioning iron from the gyrodiorite um, melt, from the gyrodiorite magma into this carbonate melt that was forming along its periphery. For it. We also took a look at the carbon and oxygen isotopes that were um, associated with the, the carbon and oxygen isotopes from carbonates that were hosted inside of the IOA ores um, themselves and compared them to the carbon and oxygen isotopes of fresh limestone that's distal from the contact and uh, carbonates that were found along that gabbro diorite contact. And we also did some uh, Rayleigh distillation models uh, at high and low temperature um, uh, looking at uh, how the isotopes would evolve based on high temperature and low temperature decarbonization uh, with the distal limestone as being like a starting point. And I've shown that all here on this uh, diagram that's here on the right hand side. The distillation models are shown by these uh, dotted line, the low temperature at 230 degrees is this blue line over here. And on the bottom, uh, high temperature at about 1000 degrees is this red line. And um, these uh, blue triangles represent the fresh limestone. And you can see that these orange triangles, which uh, represent the proximal limestone that's along the contact, appear to have evolved along both a high temperature and a low temperature path. Um, so consistent with both of these models that we performed. And that the IOA ore itself has carbon isotopes that are fairly consistent with derivation from the local limestone, as well as with evolution via high temperature decarbonization and reequilibration with the gabbro diorite. So it makes sense that the carbonate that's found associated with the IOA ore, and in some cases, especially in the case of Buena Vista, that's hosting the IOA ore itself, um, you know, it, it makes sense based on the isotopes and on the observations that we made on this contact that that carbonate could have been derived from this, uh, you know, anatexis of local carbonate or evaporate bearing carbonate rock. It's also worth pointing out here that the carbon isotopes or the carbon and oxygen isotopes of the carbonate that's associated with the IOA deposits is um, not consistent with a mantle source or a carbonatite uh, magma. So, you know, the take home message here is that the carbonate that's in the IOA order bodies uh, is likely derived from the local carbonate uh, that's in the system and that it's not consistent with uh, formation of these deposits via something like, you know, really evolved alkali magmatism or carbonatite magmatism. So from that, we've come up with this model for the Buena Vista system, uh, which starts with the melting or partial melting of evaporate bearing carbonate rock via um, heating from a gabbro intrusion. Um, as this melt is formed along the contact between the gabbro and the evaporite bearing carbonate rock, it acquires uh, iron from, you know, via equilibration either with the gabbro itself or with the mafic host rocks that are throughout the Humboldt complex. And as that um, iron enriched carbonate fluid uh, circulates upwards into a brecciated zone, it unmixes to uh, deposit or precipitate iron ore. And the residual brine that's left over from that, uh, the residual brine and spent ore fluid that's left over from that unmixing circulates outwards into, uh, away from the ore zone and forms the sodic calcic alteration that we see pervasively throughout these systems. Over time, as you produce more and more of this melt, uh, you get enough of that melt to form the carbonate dikes that we see cross-cutting the breccia ore bodies in the Buena Vista system. And one thing I should mention too is that dikes like this are actually a fairly common occurrence in IOA deposits. So, um, so the model that I've presented here 
um, is fairly, I, I feel is fairly compelling because it, it uh, accounts for both the presence of magmatic and hydrothermal features in these systems, as well as um, a number of the you know, normal cross-cutting relations that are seen in IOA systems more broadly. Also, it accounts for some of the more odd sort of accessory features of IOA systems. For instance, a lot of IOA systems show uh, enrichment in high field strength and rare earth elements and um, have evidence that rare earth elements and high field strength elements have been redistributed and uh, moved around in these systems over time. And that's something that we saw in Buena Vista specifically. On the left-hand side, I've just shown, this is a CL image of one of the host appetites that we looked at in this study. And you can see that there's a primary generation of appetite that's kind of like the CL gray. And then there's kind of like this chaotically gross zoned area that's, uh, you know, has a very low like CL black, CL dark response. Um, and uh, in the right-hand side, I've shown some time of flight uh, ICPMS maps of this very same zone. And you can see that this uh, CL dark area is depleted in the uh, lanthanum, thorium, uh, ytterbium, and, uh, and other uh, rare earth elements and the high field strength elements. Um, and that the secondary appetite is associated with essentially like the, the removal or the depletion of those elements. Um, another thing I'll point out is that this zone of uh, you know, rare earth elements, high field strength element um, uh, depletion is rimmed with calcium carbonate. So essentially you can think of this as like a progressing front of uh, appetite dissolution and recrystallization that's mobilizing um, these rare earth elements, high field strength elements. And this front is essentially um, you know, rimmed with calcium carbonate. So you can imagine a calcium carbonate or a carbonate bearing fluid you know, if it's mediating this, you're gonna have it essentially along that front of replacement that's going on. Another thing I'll point out, and, and this is, you know, just, just because I kind of think it's cool. Um, in that secondary appetite, there are coarsely crystalline uh, rare earth element phases. So not just like minor like monazites and xenotimes, but actually like fairly large crystals of alanite that have high rare earth element um, compositions. And there's also uh, fairly large crystals of thorite and those are shown right here. This is a, BS, a BSE image and this is a, um, a, a CL image. And uh, I really think this is cool because it shows a lot of different uh, relationships here, both that you see this primary appetite and this chaotically zoned secondary appetite that's rimming these kind of rare earth element phases. But also if you look closely in the areas that have the thorite, it looks like in the CL image, like someone touched the sample with like a permanent marker or something like that. And what that is, is that the CL response of the appetite has been like dulled or like, muted by the radiation damage from the thorite that's in the appetite itself. And I, yeah, I just think that that's really cool. Um, here's uh, on the right hand side is a picture of the actual sample that we're looking at in these images. The area uh, in the images is outlined in red and then in the dotted line is defining this is a nice uh, euhedral appetite crystal. We're looking right down the c-axis and it's uh, rimmed by calcium carbonate. Um, and this is uh, one of the samples that's taken from that dike-like feature at Buena Vista. So some pretty cool stuff. And the take home message here from the last two slides is that this uh, carbonate rich fluid that's circulating through these systems, you know, likely accounts for this redistribution of rare earth elements and high field strength elements and the coarsening of some of those uh, high field strength element rich phases uh, through the evolution of these systems. One other thing is that uh, in a comparison of the neodymium and strontium isotopes, um, you know, a comparison between the host rocks for several IOA deposits and the actual IOA ore in a number of different systems shows that there is in the host rocks as well as in the ore itself, a great deal of crustal contamination. And, um, you know, specifically, we'll look down here at this spot that represents a LACO. The contaminant, you know, it has a, uh, you know, a high composition or a high content of strontium-87. So it pushes these, you know, the strontium-87, strontium-86 ratio to the right, while leaving the neodymium essentially unchanged. And, you know, this type of uh, pattern is fairly consistent with the assimilation of sedimentary material that would have a lot of strontium and not a lot of neodymium. And in particular, in El Laco, um, a comparison between the sulfur isotopes and the strontium, strontium isotopes um, would indicate that, you know, a likely candidate for that, cont that contamination would be uh, limestones or evaporate rich rocks that underlie uh, most of the system. So based on that, you know, 
what about El Waco? You know, it's, it's arguably the most important IOA system in the world. And if the model that I'm talking about here um, applies to IOA systems more broadly, then surely we must be able to find some evidence of this going on in this system as well. Um, so as a, a final part of my PhD thesis, I was lucky enough to um, get some samples from Paseos Blancos, which is shown right here near the center of the uh, El Laco complex. And um, Paseos Blancos is a fairly unique part of the El Laco complex because it's um, a big breccia pipe. It's not one of these large flow-like structures, but it's you know what you might think of as being underlying a lot of this complex. And uh, the pipe itself is composed of magnetite cemented breccias that kind of grade downwards into massive magnetite ores. And uh, near the top, this uh, breccia pipe is capped with a rock that looks like what I've shown here on the right-hand side of this slide where you have you know, intergrown um, abundant magnetite and diopside. And this area grades upwards into pegmatite-like veins uh, or dikes, depending on how you want to look at them, that have magnetite and diopside along their periphery and anhydrate center lines. And as you go shallower in the system, this uh, area grades into um, acid sulfate alteration and large areas that are capped with um, sulfate in the form of gypsum. And at depth, there are large zones of sulfate alteration that can be up to several meters thick. So essentially, you go from massive magnetite ores uh, in a brecciated matrix to something that's diopside and magnetite to something that's more of like pegmatite veins that have diopside, magnetite, and anhydrite. And those grade upward into a, a large zone of sulfate dominated uh, alteration that caps uh, Paseos Blancos. So for um, my look at the Alaco system, I examined uh, rocks that, that are similar to what's shown here on the right-hand side that are these diopside magnetite rocks. Uh, and I also took a look at some of these uh, pegmatite veins. And specifically, I looked at inclusions that were hosted in the magnetite and in the diopside from this uh, part of the Alaco system. So what did we find? Well, um, you know, very broadly, the observations that we made in Paseos Blancos are, you know, very, very similar to what we saw in, in Iron Springs, where you have abundant sulfate-rich inclusions that have a significant uh, iron content in the form of hematite um, and, uh, you know, typically include other sulfate-rich phases. Um, and uh, high temperature microthermometry uh, showed that these fluids also show temperatures that are consistent with their formation at magmatic conditions. And in temperature ranges that are like spot on for what we observed in uh, Iron Springs and in Buena Vista. One key difference though, is that these inclusions, uh, especially in the cores of diopside crystals tend to be a lot more silica rich. So about, uh, you know, I'd say half, you know, half of the volume is filled with silica rich phases. And those include case, K feldspar, uh, albite, and quartz in proportions that are roughly about, you know, andesite to rhyolite in composition. So, you know, this inclusion, you'd have half of this filled with sulfate and the other half is filled with silicate and iron oxide and so forth. And, you know, there's a characteristic, um, um, you know, gradation from the centers of these crystals where they're very silica rich to their rims where they're, you know, essentially just sulfate inclusions that have iron oxide. And, you know, it's pretty remarkable. We found these not just in the diopside, but in the magnetite ores themselves. Here are some pictures on the bottom right hand side of the slide and in albite, in the accessory albite that's found in Paseos Blancos, which is a fairly unusual thing. You know, normally you don't find a lot of really nice inclusions in feldspar. And now I just want to, you know, point out here that what we're looking at here is likely residual melt that uh, is left over after extensive amounts of fractional crystallization. And, you know, that makes perfect sense. You know, in Paseos Blancos, you know, you grade from a massive magnetite ore body. And if you imagine that there's a fluid that's moving through there, it's precipitating out uh, iron oxide. And as it loses its iron oxide, its composition becomes more silica, you know, silica and sulfate rich. And especially if this is a fluid that's, you know, uh, derived from essentially the assimilation of evaporite bearing, um, you know, carbonate sediments by a silicate melt, and the assimilation of that fluid is driving the enrichment of iron in that you know, residual melt that's been assimilated. And so you know, it makes sense that you would have something that starts out very iron rich with a, a portion of silica, you know, some silica rich phases and sulfate. And as you precipitate out that iron, you form iron rich ore bodies. And then eventually the system grades into something that has a greater silica uh, proportion or greatest, you know, is more silicious. 
and then eventually is pretty much all sulfate. And you know that's the exact same gradation that we see from the cores to the rims of the uh, diopside crystals, where you have you know sulfate silicate inclusions in the cores and sulfate inclusions in the rims. And it's also the very same uh, gradation that we see in these pegmatite veins that are kind of emanating outwards from Viseos Blancos, where you start out with something that's, you know, magnetite and diapside to something that's diapside to something that's eventually anhydrite. And, you know, that's exactly what you would expect to see if, you know, in a situation where you had an iron rich melt that's associated, you know, that's mixing, uh, that's formed from a silicate melt that's assimilated some of this evaporating carbonate bearing material. And, you know, from that melt, uh, fractionally crystallizing, you know, during the formation of these deposits. Um, also, I just, you know, as a, a little aside here, I want to give a shout out to Matt. I, I saw his presentation uh, earlier on this week. And uh, I wanted to say that the magnetite that we looked at in Paseos Blancos also has this really beautiful trestle texture that he described in his presentation. And I didn't realize that this uh, texture you know, or rather, I, I had always uh, interpreted myself and others that have looked at Alaka, I've interpreted this as being the exolution lamellae of uh, ilmenite. And that's, you know, kind of bore out in this EDS image that shows these lamellae that are defined by high titanium. I didn't realize, though, that this could also be formed by this uh, CO2, uh, you know, dr driven uh, oxidation of the magnetite itself. And, you know, that's another thing that kind of, it, it all Together. You know, if you're, you know, evap if you're uh, assimilating evaporite bearing sediments and, you know, carbonate bearing sediments, you're going to have some amount of decarbonization that happens and de devolization that happens, and it's going to produce a lot of CO2. And, uh, you know, we, we didn't necessarily find a lot of CO2 rich inclusions in any of these systems. But, you know, in light of uh, his uh, talk, I kind of wonder if this is an evidence of CO2 flux throughout this system, but that's all on a side. Um, so finally, here's our model for the uh, Elaco system, where you have an andesite uh, magma at depth that's assimilating some of this, you know, evaporate and carbonate bearing, evaporate and carbonate bearing sedimentary rock. And uh, in this particular case, it seems, uh, you know, logical that that uh, assimilation of evaporate bearing uh, rock or evaporation of, uh, or assimilation of uh, sulfate bearing uh, strata would drive the formation of an iron rich melt. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I think an open question, but at least in El Laco, it seems like that iron rich melt was emplaced and the fluid itself precipitated a uh, massive magnetite, which formed the dikes and the flows. And over time is that uh, ore rich fluid uh, eventually fractionally crystallized. It ended up forming, you know, more of these diopside magnetite rich rocks and eventually the uh, magnetite diopside anhydrite pegmatites that we see in Pasos Blancos. So to kind of wrap things up, you know, the, you know, to harken back to the beginning of this talk, you know, I said it's kind of a point of controversy about whether or not these, you know, iron oxide magmas exist, you know, just because of some of the challenges that we face in the experimental models for how they form. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of review of that. And I've just shown an abstract from a paper by uh, Donald Lindsay and Nathan Epler. And, you know, <laughs> just from the title, you can tell, you know, they're not convinced that iron titanium oxide magmas exist. But I've blown up this little section there at the end of their abstract, because I think it kind of gets at my point here. And that's that, you know, while these titanium rich iron oxide magmas maybe don't exist, it seems, you know, likely that iron, that low titanium, titanium poor magmas likely do exist and that the introduction, at least based on their um, analysis here in this paper, that carbon seems like it has a key role in stabilizing these magmas at temperatures that are reasonable for the formation of uh, iron oxide deposits. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something that's consistent with this magmatic model that's been applied to a lot of IOA systems and indeed has been applied to Alaco. So you got to ask yourself, what would be the key evidence? Like, what would be the smoking gun for this, you know, sort of process? And I would argue, you know, could the 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 key piece of evidence would be is if you could observe um, the formation of an iron oxide rich melt in the igneous rocks that are associated with these systems. So, you know, in the andesite at Alaco or in, you know, the gabbro diorite at uh, Buena Vista or the monzonite at, at Iron Springs. And if you could observe that iron oxide melt, uh, you know, if you can make an observation that there was also a good portion of that melt that was, you know, carbonate or sulfate, you know, that would be like the smoking gun. So, I don't want to go into um, this uh, data too much. Uh, this is from some colleagues of mine at uh, 
at um, Memorial University, uh, you know, John Hanser and his uh, student Dorota. Um, and they've uh, been doing some really wonderful work looking at, uh, at um, residual glasses that are in plagioclase crystals from El Aco. And uh, this is a picture from uh, Velasco 2016 of some of the material that they're working on. And you can see in this glass, there are some of these globules that are composed of uh, CPX and iron oxide. And um, the accessory phases inside of the globules uh, in some of this imaging that they've done indeed uh, seem like they have uh, inclusions with very consistent phase ratios that are dominated by carbonate. And so very, some very compelling stuff and it'll be exciting to uh, see you know, the rest of their study when it comes out. So finally, um, you know, the cross-country relationships that we see in El Aco and Iron Springs and in um, Buena Vista are, are not unusual. Like they're actually the, the norm in most IOA systems. And so I've compiled this list here of places that either uh, have very clear cross-country relationships between intrusive rocks and um, evaporite bearing sedimentary sequences or have direct evidence for the assimilation of carbonate and evaporite bearing sedimentary rocks. And, you know, it would, it, it'll be really interesting to see, you know, if we had an opportunity to look at the ore phase mineralogy from these systems, you know, to evaluate whether or not the model that we've presented here, which is, you know, fairly unusual, but, you know, to see if, you know, we can find similar evidence in these systems or what kind of observations we make of the inclusions. And, you know, I'll, I'll close by saying, you know, this is an unusual model that I've presented here, but, you know, at the same time, IOA systems are unusual rocks. So I feel like that, uh, you know, it all fits together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wyatt, for that great presentation. Um, we do have some time for questions, so we'll maybe try and use the raising your hand thing in the reactions thing, or if that doesn't work, just uh, either raise your hand in reality or, or just speak up. 